Hi folks, let's machine this mosquito airplane part. Let's talk about the setups and work holding. Let's talk about the cam. And we made two major mistakes on this part. Let's show what they are and how we can fix them going forward. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So what is this part? It is a mosquito airplane angle joint wing to fuselage bracket. We had a customer who actually took one of our training classes who's restoring one of these planes. And I believe uh, you're allowed to do that subject to the Experimental Aviation Association where if you build a certain percentage of the plane, you're allowed to make a lot of it yourself. That's really cool. So our goal with this video is to show the work holding the cam. We're not sending this part to the customer because we are not qualified to do aerospace or airplane work. Nevertheless, pretty cool to take a look at this old print. It's a casting, uh, not practical to have this part recast as a one-off, so let's machine it from billet. Grabbing some raw material to cut off a piece on the Saunders plate and the DeWalt chop saw. Material is one and a half inch square 6061 aluminum. As you can see in our Fusion 360 stock, we're saw cutting a six inch width. That gives us plenty of room on each side to clean up those faces. Holding it in our DIY talon grip vice inserts. We love these. You can buy them ready-made from Mighty Bite. These are the ones that we made back in Wednesday Widget 126. Quick cleanup of the top face with a Superfly. We only have a small area that will actually be left, but this helps clean that up and it gives us a good datum to work off of. If you're running these in production, skip this step. We'll be using a flat end mill later. You could use that same tool to deck this off later. That would be a very quick tool path and it would save you a tool change. Next up, coming in with the shear hog, our go-to recipe, 785 surface feet per minute, 10 thou feed per tooth, 0.2 inch width of cut or optimal load and 0.2 inch roughing step down. We're using the 3D adaptive for this operation. It removes most of the material for the part. If you're new to Fusion 360, there's a couple differences between 2D adaptive and 3D adaptive. And obviously with 2D adaptive, it's only able to machine in two dimensions. So it wouldn't be able to take into account the fact that we've got curvatures along the third axis or the Z axis. But the bigger difference is the fact that the 2D adaptive clearing, it doesn't do anything and still you start picking lines and you start building up that tool path. You say, hey, I wanna machine around this part here. Whereas the 3D adaptive toolpath not only machines in three dimensions, but it's using the 3D model. It's using the solid body of this CAD file that we have. So literally in our geometry, we have nothing selected. We just clicked OK and we get this toolpath. Combine that with Fusion 360 templates, card here to the NYC CNC templates, and you've got a really powerful recipe to create good cam and quick cam. Next up, a 3 8 inch Lakeshore Carbide 3 flute end mill. We need the 3 8 inch diameter because we're taking a relatively tall cut here, 1.4 inches. But by using a 0.375 diameter tool, we're doing less than four times the diameter stick out. And that's a, a, a key threshold to keep in mind. For example, if we had used a quarter inch tool, we would have been at five and a half times stick out. Much more difficult to avoid chatter and get good surface finishes and tolerances. When you start stepping up in tool diameter, really on any machine, you're increasing tool pressure. General words of wisdom would be reduce your surface footage, but keep that chip load up, keep that feed per tooth up. We're one thousandth of an inch is fine here because it's aluminum, it's very forgiving and free cutting material. Sometimes on steel and other materials, you actually wanna increase that feed per tooth. Next up, doing some cleanup passes, but I didn't wanna use a horizontal because we didn't like the tool path. So here is our tool path. How did you get this? It's actually a pretty cool trick that I think is underutilized. It's a 2D contour. I'll go into edit, passes, and I've got roughing passes turned on. And I duplicated this as a demonstration. I'm gonna program a relatively large number of step overs, say 100. Click OK, and you can see it's creating way, way, way more passes than we need to. But all we've gotta do, go back into edit, geometry, stock contours, choose the outside profile of our part, and it will now limit the roughing passes to the stock that we've selected. A really nice way to contain that tool path, and a lot of times we prefer the look and the cutting action of this over the horizontal.
Next up, spotting those five holes. If you're in production, we can lower that retract plane. Right now it's set to model top, so every time it's gonna retract all the way to the top of the model, plus the 50 thou. We can change that to be feed height, so it's actually going to retract from the feed height plus 50 thou. I like that. The problem right now is that the clearance height is set to the retract height. So now I'd want to change this to be, say, the stock top or model top plus 50 thou. That way, the first time you're going in and coming out, you're doing a much safer linking move. 5 16 twist drill running 180 surface feet per minute, 3,000 feet per rev. Now we're applying these relatively large countersink. Really easy to get chatter with these. The trick is go slow. But what do I mean by slow? Relatively low surface speed, 200 feet per minute, but keep that feed per rev at something reasonable. In this case, five thousandths of an inch feed per rev. You don't want the tool turning too fast, but you still need to drill deep enough that you're actually creating a chip. If you're on an even lighter duty machine, reduce that surface footage even lower. 50 or 100 would be fine. So next up is the surfacing. So we're using a parallel toolpath with a 3 8 inch ball-in mill to surface or create those in a 3D profile. The other way we could do this would be to add an operation or add a setup. We could use a couple of fasteners, bolt this at a 90 degree angle and have a tool come in and walk along this. It would be much quicker and you would actually get a better surface finish than you would having to spend the time to run a parallel toolpath with relatively small step overs. We used a 10 thousandths of an inch. So it's really pick your poison. Would you rather have the time of an extra setup or we can go ahead and make this on a surfaced operation. A couple of quick chamfers along the outside of the part. Then we're coming in and we're using a bullnose end mill to surface out the inside fillet. So this was actually really tricky. It took us a while to get this tool path nailed down. We're using a scallop and we actually went through it in a Fusion 360 live video. Bottom line is we use the patch environment card here to some of our patch video tutorials on the nyccnc.com website. But that let us create the right toolpath that we wanted. It extended that toolpath out of hair, gave it some really good blend lines, and to create that inside diameter radius. Very useful when you don't have a bullnose end mill with the perfect matching fillet radius. Done with op one. Flip it over. So we're using a gauge block. We're zeroing off of that gauge block with our Heimer. Once we find that zero point, we know our part is 1.4 inches tall. So in Pathpilot, we can say that the top of that gauge block is negative 1.4 inches, and then all we've got to do is locate off the center of that hole for X and Y, and we've got a very accurate way to have flipped this part for that second operation. So two things to note here. Number one, we usually won't use the Superfly to make a face cut like this unless there's very little overhanging material. If there's too much overhanging material, you'll curl that material up and you'll tear it out of the vise and probably ruin your Superfly. The bigger problem is this is where we start to make the major mistake on this part, which is we held the tolerance of thickness, but the part doesn't remain flat. We'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> Flipping the part up and holding it against a 246 block with a cant twist clamp and a shim just to protect the surface finish. But this was a, the second mistake, and this one is on us. We should have choked up higher on that clamp, and we should have used more clamping pressure. It wasn't as obvious when you're machining the part, but you can clearly see on video that part deflecting, both during the spot and during the drill. Now, luckily, per the print, it's just a clearance hole, but still, no. Not a good example of a reliable, safe work holding method that lends itself to making really good parts, especially on a part like this, where whoever's making this part for their plane, the stakes are high. So let's go back to that first mistake. Take a look at the photo. The part is very clearly bowed along this relatively thin bottom edge, and that's really important. The bow is only about 30 thousandths of an inch, but it looks terrible, and I don't like it. If you look at the description of this part, it is holding the wing to the fuselage, and I'm not an aerospace engineer or an airplane engineer, but that sounds pretty important. So we rewind a second. This print is from 1944. The material was dural. 
Dural appears to be an outdated trade name, but it really relates to the 2000 series grades of aluminum. The part was a forging. So I called up our friend Paul Debolt uh, over at Debolt Machine, who we've done some really good videos with, and he's also pretty experienced in the, the forging and casting world. And he had mentioned that you may have some wiggle room here because modern day extrusions tend to be quite strong relative to you know, 50, 60 year old aluminum technology. We've actually come quite a ways uh, in aluminum. It's kind of funny, aluminum used to be a really exotic alloy because it was so expensive uh, or difficult to make. Now it's, it's obviously quite common. The problem is that we're machinists, we're not metallurgists and we're not aerospace engineers. So I'm not qualified to make that decision. What I am qualified to do is say, I don't like how this part turned out. So what are some other things that we could do to machine this better? The first answer that comes to mind is we're, we were only leaving about a hundred thousandths of an inch of material on the bottom side. And this extrusion has some built up stress, or if it didn't from the extrusion process, it certainly does when we're machining this whole area away. It's gonna naturally want to curl up. If you've machined cold rolled steel, you'll know this happens quite readily. We actually haven't seen it happen this often in aluminum, and I was a little bit surprised with this part adding more material on the underside can help even out the stresses as you machine away from both sides. We could try, instead of using the Superfly, when we deck this off, we could use a smaller diameter tool that may change the way it relieves those stresses. I'm not sure that would work, but it's something we could try. You could also leave some extra material on this side, skim cut the back side down, and then come back and finish this top side. Again, trying to tackle it more evenly from both sides. You could back bend the part, I'm sure it's done. Again, I don't like it, period, let alone in this application, given that the part is for an airplane. Or you could possibly redesign the part. Making this face thicker would give you a lot of stability. It's a quarter inch, so you could potentially increase it by 50 or 100 thousandths of an inch. Or we're machining it. Why not just extend these ribs out? It would give you a lot of additional strength along this face. We had fun making the part. Again, I think a lot of the takeaways here are the work holding techniques, how do you walk through the operations, as well as some of the tips and tricks in the Fusion 360 cam side. Hope you guys learned, hope you enjoyed. Take care, see you next Wednesday.